You know, I, I, uh, I, I won't do what I am tempted to do and Go tell ahead, you all the it. wonderful stories of, <laughs> of how you wrote my life and how I've grown up to you, and I still drive around on the weekends and listen to you because I promised my listeners I wouldn't. But I have to tell you, this is – this is this is one of my greatest thrills on radio to have you well, on my thank show, you. It's sir. It's a pleasure to be on the show with you. The great Mickey Gilly. My <laughs> parents, when they got married, they honeymoon, working class, decent, honest, wonderful people who I'm I'm happy to say are still with us, and they came over and they saw you, and uh, my mom gave you a big kiss on the lips. Probably the only man she ever kissed, other than my dad. Wow! <laughs> and it is still to this day a big thrill. And we had a, we had a big a big kick last night that she was so thrilled I was going to have you on the show. Oh, uh, well, so. you just be sure and tell her I said a big hello. I will do it. It was it was you and Johnny yeah. Lee, and yeah. that that just did it for her. I had a, I had a lady come through the uh, autograph line the other night, and she said uh, when the Urban Cowboy hit, she said I was living in Hammond, Louisiana. She said, I told my husband, said, uh, I'm going to Gilly's. She said, what do you want to go there for? I said, I want to see Mickey Gilly and Johnny Lee. He said, no, we're not going to go. She said, so I killed him. Oh. She said, I just got out now. Do <laughs> you want to get married? <laughs> you know, it's been interesting uh, all day. We, we've been, I announced yesterday that you were coming in studio and to hear, I mean, you your your records have sold worldwide, but, but this is your community, Pasadena and the greater Houston area. And how many folks have emailed me with stories in their own way? A guy called in and his grandparents were your dry cleaners and it really a friend of mine a woman that worked for me my chief of staff at city hall her brother was your ups delivery driver and it's just it's yeah. neat that these people really you know they everybody feels like they know you well you know i've been very fortunate michael i've had uh, uh i've been blessed with 17 number one songs in my career and uh, like i tell people i said you know it's been a it's been a great ride if it ended tomorrow i can't complain uh, I've had a, a, a wonderful time. I got to be involved in what uh, the Guinness Book of Records list is the world's largest honky tonk gillies. Uh, we now have a um, place in Vegas. That I'm very proud of you know with uh, Treasure Island. We have right. a gillies I there. Just saw it. Yeah. We have we just opened one up uh, June the first in Durand, Oklahoma, at Choctaw Nations with a gillies there with a mechanical bull and a whole bed. You know. Carry, carrying the tradition on, we have one in Dallas, and then of course we have my restaurant there in, in Branson, and uh, also my theater. So I've been trying to keep the Gilly name out there, and hopefully one day we'll have one back in Pasadena. You know, does it surprise you? Mickey Gilly's our guest. Does it surprise you? We're going to talk about this book, Unconquered, that's just been written about you and your cousins. But does it surprise you? I think it was '74. You were New Artist of the Year, and you know you really came onto the scene, even though you'd been singing for a while before that the national scene in the early 70s and here we are 40 years later and you're opening things with your name and what meaning that has not to your generation but to mine i'm 41 and i feel like we're <laughs> we're contemporary does that surprise you the longevity yes i don't mind telling you that i'm doing my life story in music at my theater in branson i started in the 50s when i first started i played my first recording and i made the remark i said now you know why it took me 17 years to have a hit <laughs> are you doing that now i'm doing uh, my life story in music and uh and my theater in Branson, I start from the 50s and go all the way to the, uh, the present time, uh, through the urban cowboy craze. And uh, it's a very uh, uh, interesting performance that we try to do for them because we give them a little uh, insight on what my life has been all about, you know. And being as old as I am now, you know, it's been, been a thrill for me to do it. My son, Michael, and my tech people in my theater wrote the show for me. And we put it together and started doing it. We've been having a blast doing it. Have a good, great time doing it. So if I want to come out and see that, when, when oh, I, I want you to come to Branson and see it. Yeah, we're, we're do, I'm only working three nights a week and during the summer months only in my three. theater. I'm working a, a Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night. We're still doing some road dates, but uh, uh, I'm only working three days in my theater. And I have a group called Six that's got the hottest ticket in Branson now. People never heard of them. It's Six Brothers. They do their music uh, with their their vocals. No band. And it's a very entertaining and very interesting show that they do. So if people come to Branson, Missouri, I want to invite them to come see my show, of course. But if they get a chance to come see Six, I think they'll enjoy that also. I saw, I don't know, it was a few months ago, you and Johnny Lee were going to be performing somewhere in Pearland, maybe it was. We, we, we worked Pearland, and uh, we had, had a great time, except we had a very, very difficult time with the sound system. Well, I, I think that people, the memories people have over the years, and it was so special to so many people, and then Urban Cowboy hit, and I think that, that crossed you over from the country charts to you know everybody knowing about it. Does, it. does it shock you going back? We were talking earlier in the show. There's not an evening that seems like it goes by that I'm flipping around channels, and there's Urban Cowboy, and I get to hear all that wonderful old music. I brought mine. Well, you know what? I got to I got to say a special thanks to John Travolta for doing that film because uh, he's the one that gave it the uh, credibility that it did by coming off of a Saturday Night Fever, you know, 
And actually, it turned out to be a, a country night fever is what it amounted to. The Urban Cowboy was nothing, no more than a country night fever. He'd come and did all the country dances. And uh, that's what launched it into the stratosphere. And, of course, I had the film, I had the song Stand By Me, and, of course, John Lee had Looking For Love, which right. was uh, two major songs for us in the film. And uh, I'm still uh, living off the fact that uh, the success I've had down through my career performing. Well, it's 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 so much fun as a Houstonian what that song did and how many people think that, you know, that's the only image of Houston they have. And I'm OK with that. Well, I had a song called Overnight Sensation, too, but I, I, like a long way from being an overnight sensation. It took me 17 years before Room Full of Roses hit. You know, I was about to say Room Full, Room Full of Roses. That's that's the one that really gets me. We're going to have a quick break and we talk about this book. But I, I was reading um, about your start and Jerry Lee Lewis's uh, big hit um when, when Jerry Lee Lewis made it big and that kind of got you into the music business, and I was driving around one weekend, I think it was Bill Anderson's show, and you were talking about, I guess you were working and you couldn't get into one of Jerry Lee's songs, uh, in, into one of Jerry Lee's shows, and that kind of got you into music. Did I hear well, that? Well, that's exactly what happened. I, he actually came to Houston uh, at doing a concert when he had Crazy Arms and a whole lot of shaking had just come out, and uh, he was doing a concert. And I had a chance to uh, go to the concert, and I had a chance to take him to the airport the next day. And that's when Hobby was the only airport in Houston. And this is back in the 50s now. And uh, he reached in his pocket and pulled out more money than I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I said, wow, I'm in the wrong business. I was doing construction work. And I decided I'd throw my hat in the ring, not knowing at the time that everybody was going to accuse me of copying my cousin, Jerry Lee Lewis. Right. But I was successful doing his music because I could play the piano and sing. Um, and after I started having hits, then I started having fun with it. You know, I, I tell people, you know, I said, you know, I got accused of copying my cousin for many, many years. And, but I won't tell you all, I wasn't trying to copy him. I was trying to be exactly like him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about his cousin and a new book about those cousins in Faraday, Louisiana, and so much more coming up. Mickey Gillies, our guest on The Michael Berry Show. The Michael Berry Show. What did you say? Uh, the Michael Berry Show? Say that again. The uh, Michael Berry Show? Faster. The Michael Berry Show? You better listen. listen. A one, a two, a one, two, three, go. And the girls all get prettier at closing time How they all begin to look like movie stars How the girls all I told y'all I'd try not to embarrass myself with Mickey Gillian in studio, so I'll behave. <laughs> It's Where such a pleasure. J.D. Davis has written a book called Unconquered about Mickey Gilly, his cousins Jerry Lee Lewis, and Jimmy Swagger. Tell me about that, J.D. You know, I listened to these guys' music even back to my own childhood. Um, I grew up in a small northeast Texas community where country music was the name of the game. Uh, Mickey was throwing out hits left and right. His cousin Jerry at that point had crossed over from rock and roll to country. My father watched Reverend Swaggart on television, and it just seemed like an amazing story. All three of these guys are larger than life, and when you throw into the mix that they're first cousins born within 12 months of each other that grew up right down the street from each other, it just makes for an inst a story that – is truly incredible. The book is Unconquered. We've put a link to it on our blog. You can go to michaelberry.iheart.com. You can grab it there. What did you find out in this book that really surprised you? Oh, wow. There's a mountain of information in this book, a lot of it that, did, that didn't make it onto the pages, um, but just really fascinating stories that would surprise a lot of people. You know, um, a lot of people would be surprised to know that Reverend Swagger, when he was a kid, he was kind of a tough kid. His dream was to be heavyweight champion of the world. Most people don't know that. Um, Jerry actually spent some time in Waxahachie, Texas at Bible College, was actually training to become a minister, if you can believe that, <laughs> uh, from the guy who turned into the iconic rock and roll bad boy. Right. And Mickey Gilly, I think the most amazing thing about Mickey, who I'm honored to call a friend at this point, is here's a man who didn't have his first number one hit until he was 38 years old, and he is truly... Not only a great musician, but he's probably even more importantly, he's just a good guy. So I'm 41. You think there's still hope for me? There's still hope. There's always <laughs> hope. I could redo Room Full of Roses. I mean, most folks, the young folks may not have heard of that yet. So I could, <laughs> I could start all over. What was the most fun for you, Mickey, the, the, the song you sang that you just had the most fun with? Well, the most fun I had was when I got to do some <clears throat> some duets with Charlie McLean because we had, we took a song called uh, Candyman that Roy Orbison had done, and we rearranged it and we made a duet out of it. And I had the biggest uh, uh, the, the biggest time, I, I guess I should say, recording that song because it was so different than the way we did it. 
but uh, the incredible thing about Room Full of Roses, I don't know if you ever knew this story, but I actually, it was the B-side of uh, She Called Me Baby All Night Long. Uh, the, the lady had the jukebox in Gillies, asked me if I'd record She Called Me Baby. She'd heard me do it on my TV show uh, locally here in Houston. Mm-hmm. And when I uh, went into the recording studio to record She Called Me Baby, uh, I looked over and uh, the bass guitar player said, okay, uh, we got that done. What are we going to do for the other side of the record? You're not going to use She Called Me Baby on both sides, are you? And I said, well, no. He said, well, we need another song. And so right off the top of my head, I said, maybe we ought to do the old song Room Full of Roses. Now, I grew up singing that song with right. Jimmy and Jerry in right. Houston, down in Faraday when we were kids growing up. And uh, they asked, how does it go? So I took the piano and I played it for them. They wrote a little chart on it. And we started into it. And I got about 45, 50 seconds into the song. And I stopped. And I said, no, I don't want to do this. He said, why not? I said, because it's going to sound too much like Jerry Lee Lewis. Mm. And the bass player said, what difference does it make? Nobody will ever hear it. And, you know, at that time... Thinking about it, it's just going to be on 300 jukeboxes. I didn't think about it, anything about it either. So we, I went ahead and recorded it. And I, and I was thinking back here the other day, you know, that little run that I did in the piano, that uh, that uh, uh, the, the five run that I did, the one and the five, that ding 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 For some reason, I had never played that run on the piano before. And I used to practice when I would when I'd do the music at, at, the, at Gillies. I'd practice on the piano when I was doing the show. And... Um, so when I did that song, for some reason or other, I did the melody, and when I got to that little part, the melody left me, and I just did that little run down. And I think that was one of the things that made it kind of catchy. Yeah, it was like a divine thing that happened, you know, just happened that time. It, uh, I, it's funny. I think it might have been Bill Anderson's show. I listened to a lot of the old uh, interviews with, with Bill Anderson and different folks like that who do this, and I think it was him who was interviewing me, and I was driving back from Austin to Houston, and I remember I was in front of the old original Austin airport, when I looped back, I had a few minutes for my plane, and you were telling this story, and you were telling about the opening of that, and it was just so. It's still to me to this day compelling. It, it was incredible, you know. And and uh, the thing about it was, I tell the story in my in my performance when I'm doing my life story in, in music, and I tell the people, you know, I said I I, I took the record after it sold twenty thousand plus copies in Houston, and I jump on an airplane and go to Nashville trying to because it's on a local label here in Houston. I said I got to get it out nationally. I wanted to try to get it on the, either Epic, uh, Columbia, or uh, Mercury, or you know one of the uh, RCA. I to get it on a major label and every record company turned it down and i'm getting ready to leave nashville i'm dejected again you know i mean i went through all different things in my career of trying to have success and every time i'd get to the point where it was right there it zip away from me you know and he said i got a company to take it and i said who and he said playboy records and i thought he was putting me on Mm -hmm. and i screamed at him on the phone i said are you kidding me and uh, he said, come on over to the office. And so he threw a record at me, had little bunny heads on it. And I make the comment. Of course, it's just a comment that I'm making in the show. I said, I said, him and I j- jump on the airplane. We're going to Los Angeles. I'm in my cowboy outfit and to meet Hugh Hefner in his pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, a life well lived. A life well lived. You talk about growing up in the Assembly of God Church. There's a lot of gospel elements to what you do. Absolutely. I started out playing the gospel music with my mom. Me and my mom would sing, and I never really thought about going to the music industry until Jerry Lee hit with a whole lot of shaking. I never even dreamed that I'd ever get into it. Saved up a couple hundred bucks, made my first record, didn't get any airplay, made the second record, uh, tried to go all the way to Philadelphia and try to get on the uh, American Bandstand with Dick Clark, couldn't do that. I went into uh, uh, the William Morris Agency in New York City, auditioned for them. They turned me down. Said, we got one Julie Lewis, we don't need another one. And I went back to uh, doing construction work. Came back, and I'm working construction. I get a call from a guy by the name of Leland Rogers, and that's Kenny Rogers' brother, by the way. Mm. And I mentioned that in the show, you know, and I said, uh, he said, I got some songs. I uh, understand you can do the Jerry, St- Jerry style of music. I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, I'd like to listen to you. So I went over and I played him a song called Is It Wrong for Loving You? And of all things, Kenny Rogers played the bass on that particular song. And so I, I used that in the show, too, and I played a little bit. So you do you'll do a song and then like a singer songwriter you you do a song and then you talk about well the, that I, point when in your I life. do I play the original record for him uh, when when I when they hear the uh, the first original song that I ever recorded and that's when I roll out and I say you know folks now you understand why it took me seventeen years to have a right. hit record but when Room, Room Full of Roses hit I wasn't even thinking about having a hit because I'd been trying all those years and nothing was happening and then of course when Room Full of Roses hit back in nineteen seventy four uh, I was astonished it, it just it didn't make any sense to me uh, my my first uh, TV appearances with was with uh, um, Porter Wagner and uh, Miss Dolly Parton. And uh, I was 38 years old, and I was scared to death because that was my first national shot on TV. You know, they make so much of how old Toby Keith was when he had his first. But 30, I didn't realize it. 